All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. I think I'll go up a little bit. That's good enough. Okay, um, let's see. This is all steel stuff. Let's see, uh, concrete. Okay. So let me go ahead and get this pass around, get the sign-in sheet started. Um, so just so we're all clear in terms of scheduling, so you all have a homework assignment due on Wednesday on development link. Um, what, what's that? What? It's due, no, it's due Wednesday, right? Like it's due in two days. No, hold, hold on. Now hold on. Let me make sure. Now this is our um, this is our concrete schedule, right? You're ahead of the game now. All right. Uh, Again, number four sieve, it's all I'm saying. <laughs> wow, I mean, you did the homework in advance. It's like, man, y'all are growing up and becoming engineers, man. What's going on here? <laughs> like, like, you, it's like, like you became, yeah. I, I am. It's like you leveled up. <laughs> well, the end of the semester is approaching. We're all feeling it, myself included. So I'm in it with you all. But. All right. Um, so I know that your heads are probably still swimming a little bit uh, after the second exam. I will try and get that back to you all on Wednesday. In the meantime, we do still need to press on. We have development length to cover. Were there hooks on that assignment? Yeah, the, last problem. the last problem was a hook. Okay. Then, then uh, I want to get through through the hook stuff today to kind of clarify what's going on. Hooks are generally easier than than regular development length. It's really just a different equation. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about that. So, real quick, our fundamental expression for development length. Um, we I think we've gone over this fairly. Uh, uh, extensively. We have our adjustment factors based on the location of the bars, our top bar factor, our epoxy coating uh, factor, and then we have our reinforcement size factor. Um, we have our ratio to account for spacing and cover distances based on that cylindrical bond failure that you get. Um, we have our uh, transverse reinforcement index. Remember, uh, transverse reinforcement can tend to contain that, um, uh, that uh, whatchamacallit, the, the bond failure and what have you. <laughs> All right, a couple caveats to the calculation of uh, some of these parameters in your development length uh, calculation. Make sure that is taken as the uh, uh, minimum of whatever you compute in 1.7. Um, and then uh, your reduced development length uh, accordingly. So we did this example and we did this example to sort of illustrate the, the equations. And I think any more, and we would just be beating a dead horse with this topic. It's literally just the same thing over and over again. This is a pretty technically straightforward topic. All right. Now, as you recall, some of the development links that we're getting are a little ridiculous. And so is there a way we can shorten that development length by some uh, measure of detailing or some fabrication technique, and the answer is yes, we can uh, bend our rebar into a hook. Okay, so there are two standard hooks that we use for uh, developing reinforcement in concrete design, uh, known as the 90 degree hook and the 180 degree hook. Here's the, uh, the dimensioning and the details for all of those, uh, 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 for all of those uh, uh, situations. There's the 90 degree up top, 180 below. Um, here is the, uh, the, the equation. Again, it, it's the same deal. It's another plug and chug expression. Okay? Now, we don't really care about uh, the location of bars or the bar size because when you're dealing with hooks, 
you're developing that reinforcement differently. It's not about just that longitudinal grip. You've changed the geometry of the bar, so uh, you know less goes into it. Really, the epoxy uh, coating is the only thing that can affect um, uh, your development length, and that's it. Um, so pretty plug and chug. A couple of instances. So if you've got 90 degree hooks and you've got the following cover uh, uh, requirements met, you can uh, reduce your uh, uh, development length 30% or you can multiply it by 0.7. And then you can further reduce it another 20% if you've got uh, adequate stirrup spacing uh, and, uh, throughout and at the very end. Uh, it's like, again, that transverse reinforcement contains everything. Uh, here's a detail explaining uh, what that was talking about. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Once you hit pH, are you done? Um, you can check this one, but not that one. So. But you can also, and, and I was getting to this, you can also do that. You can also do that same reduction based off of how much steel you do provide and how much you really need it. All right. Um, any questions? Okay. So, wow, those, that text came out small. I apologize for that. All right. So um, this is an example we're going to do to illustrate what's going on with development length, and then we're going to get into our last topic. I'm going to try and go through this example fairly quickly because it's a pretty straightforward uh, task. So we've got these epoxy-coated bars in this beam. They're six number nines. The beam is 14 feet or 14 inches wide. Sorry, it's a total of 20 inches deep from. The bottom to the first layer is 13 inches. This is four and a half, and this, this grid spacing here of this, these bars is four and a half inches. Um, we're going to do straight bars, assuming KTR is zero, and we're going to do bars ending in a 90 degree hook. So I, I'm basically what I'm going to do for this example is I'm going to try and illustrate, I guess, the worst case scenario and then the best case scenario and really look at how much of a difference you can get uh, in terms of your development length. So um, all the bars are top bars, you know, 4 KSI, 60 KSI, and what have you. I think that should be uh, good to go. All right, give me one moment. Okay. Uh, any questions? Oh, you sort of, you shook your head and then you didn't. Okay. Okay, so, oh goodness. Okay, so a couple beam parameters. All right, so we've got normal weight concrete with uh, a compressive strength of 4 KSI. So that's one. We've got 60 KSI bars. What's the diameter of those bars? No. They're number nine bars. What's the diameter of a number nine? Nope. Got to look it up. You have to look it up. So, let's, what? 1.128. All right. Are you all okay with where to find that? The diameter of a number nine. Remember, it's in your book. It's in the slides. It's way back up here. Let's see. What slide? 269. Yep. Yeah. Remember that table of available bar sizes? We're dealing with the number nine. Diameter is 1.128. It's also in your book, right? Every di everybody did get a book, right? They didn't, you know, get a torrent or something. And downloaded it. Well, who would ever download the book? Uh, 
I know things. <laughs> that day in steel design, Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> okay, is everybody okay with that? Okay, let's do our development length calculation assuming straight bars and then we'll go back and um, look at hooks. Okay. All right. Okay. So these are top bars. So we're going to assume, well, I mean, it's more than 12 inches. So we're going to say 1.3. All right. Um, now, our epoxy coating bars. Let's go back to the slides. Um, two, 16. Yeah, I'll go up a little bit. Okay. Epoxy coated bars with a cover less than three bar diameters or a clear spacing less than six bar diameters. Is that going to be the case for our problem? What's the bar diameter? Like 1.12 inches, right? What's the bar spacing? It's uh, um, the bar spacing's like four and a half inches. The cover's two and a half inches. So what's our side going to be? It's going to be 1.5. There we go. What the heck? thought I was using. Oh, come on. Hold on. It opened it twice. Uh, close that. There we go. So this is 1.5 and we'll say epoxy coated um, with small cover. Okay. Now, help me out. Bar size factor, what's it going to be? Move it. The bar size factor. It, it, it's supposed to be one, right? You can help out with the next one. And the reason why is because that's number nine bars. All right? Now, okay, CB. All right? Let's go back to our beam image. Um, okay. Our CB is that cover distance, and it's the minimum of three different values, so help me out. Okay, so from here to here, that's two and a half inches, right? Here to here, that's two and a half inches. Here to here, that's four and a half, so split the difference, that's... Thank, thank you, Paige. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is two. This is two and a half. This is two and a half. This is two and a quarter. Which one do we use? There we go. All right. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> All right. Okay. So for this, we're going to go ahead and take KTR to be zero, just to keep it simple. Now, if we were to just plug and chug right now into our development length expression, we would get the wrong answer because, and I think that Mr. Beals asked this question before, if I look over here on the side, if I take psi t times psi e, what do I get? 1.95, and what's wrong with that? 
There you go. So when we uh, use our development length expression, instead of plugging in these two values, I'm going to use the 1.7. So you had asked that question before, I believe, and we'll just use the 1.7. All right. Excuse me. Okay, all right. So therefore, first thing we need to compute is this ratio. All right, plug and chug, and that'll come out to 1.995. Is that an acceptable value? Because it has to be less than 2.5. Okay. If it comes out bigger, just use 2.5. So our development length is 3 over 40. Then we have lambda square root of FC prime, and then FY, and then we have psi T, psi E, psi S, over our ratio. Okay. All right, make sense? All right. Let's take care of everything on the top. So we have 3 times FY. What do we use for FY? 60,000. PSI. All right? Now, we have Psi T times Psi E or times Psi S. You tell me what to write. There you go, 1.7 times 1. Forty, bless you. Times lambda, what's lambda? Times the square root of four thousand psi, and then times that ratio one point nine nine five. All right, and so what does that give us? Make y'all do some work. Oh, the DB. Whoops. Thank you. So DB, and then that should be 1.128. Thank you. And so what should that be? 68.3. Is that what anybody else got? 111.47. I, I got 68.4, so about that. So what? 69. You have your square root? So 68.3. Okay. So, again, Make sure that you understand the physical meaning. That would mean that if we were using straight bars for this development, we would have to insert that. I mean, you'd have to have over like five feet of room for that bar to develop its capacity. That might be a hindrance depending upon your situation. It might not. I mean, if you're just trying to develop uh, in a you know, simply supported beam and you don't need those bars until mid-span, that might actually not be that big of a deal. All right, so it's just something to consider. All right, um, all right, has everybody got this? Simple, right? Okay. Okay, so. Okay. Now let's look at hooks. In this case, a 90 degree hook. Okay, now. I didn't give you any data in terms of the stirrup spacing before or after or anything like that, so there's really no reductions I'm going to do. Really, in terms of the equation, it's going to be just plug and chug. So the development length, if we used a hook, is going to be 
0 0.02. Um, oh, don't need to do that now. Lambda E, Fy over lambda F uh, C prime times the bar diameter, which is 0 0.02 times what's our epoxy factor? 1.5. Um, what do I use for Fy? 60,000 times 1.128. And what do we get? Thirty-two point one. Anybody else get that? All right. So, to answer Mr. Eukonik's question a while back about can't you just bend the bars and reduce your development length, the answer is yes. I mean, look what happened by just taking the bars and bending them. You went from sixty-eight inches to thirty-two inches. And we didn't even incorporate reductions or, or, you know, look at transverse reinforcement or anything like that. I mean, that can get shaved down pretty substantially, you know, just with a little bit of math. So that should be everything that you need for your homework, right? That was the only new part. What's that? Well, the development length expression doesn't really change. The only thing that does change is... Um, uh, the reductions that you can apply afterwards. Like, like if I go back here, give me one moment. All right, this reduction wouldn't apply if we were doing with 180, but a hook is a hook. I guess where I put 90 degrees would really matter. All right. What reduction? Well, I guess you could, but I didn't give you any data about the cover behind the hooks, did I? Like, you would need to know what was here and how much cover there was. I didn't give you that. Now, your cover on the side has to be greater than or equal to two and a half inches, which you've got that, you know. So, there's that. And I guess if we said assume sufficient cover behind the hook, you could take that and multiply it by 0 0.7. So, all right, does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, all right. You should be good to do your homework on Wednesday, which brings us into the last topic of the semester, columns. Um, a lot of what we do with straight, just columns is really easy. What gets unique and gets interesting are beam columns. If you take a member that is not only being compressed, but compressed and bent at the same time, that's when things get kind of interesting. Um, let me go ahead and pass this out. Okay, so we'll start off looking at axial load by itself and then look at axial load plus bending. Um, and we have to deal with an interesting concept in that regards. We have to deal with interaction. Um, for those of you that are in steel design or have had steel design, we've dealt with interaction before in there. Because when we looked at bolts that were subjected to shear and tension, you had the axial check, you had the bending check, and then you had the interaction between the two. And for the most part, that's kind of what we do here. The difference is with um, steel design, to calculate your interacted effect, it was just a nice, simple, pretty equation. Uh, it's not as simple in here. But that's a little bit down the road. Right now, we just need to talk about a column being subjected in compression. Okay, so, and let's just go back to fundamentals. 
that when you're looking at a reinforced concrete structure, there are two main types of elements, a beam and a column. Beams being primarily subjected to flexure, columns being primarily subjected to axial load. Um, columns get a little funky because they can see axial load and then axial load and bending moment. We'll take those one at a time. <coughs> um, now to start off our discussion of columns, we are going to, in this course, restrict what we do to what I will call short columns. Now what I mean by that is that short columns are those where we don't have to consider the effects of buckling, which it's not much different than what we do in steel design. You have an effective length factor K. It's all about determining effective lengths and what have you. It's all pretty much the same. I mean, your curves are different, but in the end, it's all the same, uh, uh, same stuff. Okay? So when we have a short column, if you will, basically the capacity is 0.85 FC prime times the area. So, um, but there are some differences associated with the behavior. It's all about the type of column that you're looking at. In reinforced concrete, we tend to deal with two types of columns, square columns and circular columns. Now, the, in, in, you know, if we ignore just the, the shape of the cross section, one being square and one being circular, one of the big differences is how we tie that reinforcement together. And if you've ever seen this done on a construction site, you'll know what I'm talking about. For square columns, you have your longitudinal reinforcement, and then it's basically just like a beam. You have sort of these stirrup you know, bands tying the reinforcement together. In a circular column, however, your reinforcement tends to be kind of spiral in nature. almost looks like one big spring uh, surrounding the section. So the, 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 the Tied, the tying reinforcement sort of spirals up the column. That changes the behavior of the column and how we compute the capacity. We'll see that here in a second. All right. So let's talk about each of those columns. So if you've got a square column, which I'd argue probably most uh, contractors and folks like that would, would like square columns because you have a square edge to go off of if you're framing everything together. <clears throat> um, basically, the long and short of it is you take that column, you apply load, concrete begins to crack, the bars buckle out, and that's basically all she wrote. Once the, uh, once the concrete on the edge spalls off, that's about it for that column. Circular columns on the other end are a little different. Because of that spiral reinforcement that goes inside the column, that spiral reinforcement tends to confine the column a little better. And spirally reinforced columns tend to have improved capacity because of that very nature. And if you go back to the, uh, or if you go through the math, um, let's go back to mechanics and materials because I, I know some of my folks who had me remember this. You remember in mechanics and materials, or mechanics of deformable bodies, sorry, mechanics of deformable bodies, um, do you remember doing thin-walled pressure vessels? Remember you had a, like a, a tank and that tank had pressure inside it and you looked at the stresses inside it? I know you did it. I know I did it for, for the folks that had for me. Do you all remember doing that? Well, what kind of happens when you look at a spirally reinforced section is that spiral reinforcement also almost acts like a pressure vessel. You apply load, the concrete inside applies pressure and it sort of Th that spiral reinforcement almost acts like a pressure vessel and it kind of contains the column a little bit. So you get sort of an improvement uh, on the, the capacity and behavior of a, of a circular column because of that. Circular, or circular columns or spiral columns, I guess if I want to be more technical, they tend to be a lot better for things like uh, seismic design uh, and what have you. All right. <coughs> Let's look at the capacity of a column. We're not going to do any math today. I just want to go through a couple things. Let's look at how to compute the capacity of a column. So you start off by computing what I'll call the theoretical capacity, P naught. P naught is 0.85 FC prime times the area of the concrete plus FY times the area of the steel. So what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, let's say you have a column. I'll make it up. Let's say it's 12 inches tall by 12 inches wide and it's got some bars in it. So the area of the concrete would be 12 times 12 minus whatever bars are in there, right? 
So that's the area of the concrete. So 0.85 FC prime times the area of the concrete plus Fy times the area of the steel. That's it for the theoretical capacity. We reduce that a little bit to count for accidental eccentricity. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. And then we multiply by phi to get the design capacity. Pretty straightforward. All right. So if we wanted to compute the design capacity of a column, that's it. Plug and chug. It's not like beams where you're having to determine the neutral axis and in some moments it's just pretty straightforward. Now, this alpha term accounts for unintended eccentricity. Oh, whoops. Can I, can I go ahead? Okay. This alpha term accounts for unintended eccentricity. The idea behind that is, is this. When we analyze a column, we assume that here's the element oriented vertically. We take the element, we apply a load, and we compute its capacity. We are assuming that that load is acting smack dab perfectly through the centroid. Perfectly. Can you tell me that it's acting perfectly through the centroid? Right there, right there. That word perfectly should be a red flag. Nothing is absolute. There's always tolerances and, 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 and errors and uncertainties. What we do to this nominal capacity is we adjust it by this term alpha to account for unintended eccentricities. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, conceptual questions and things like that. Oh, now, now it's getting to your attention. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to get the highlighters out and get the little, little notes. Oh, yeah. So that's that. All right, fee values. Look at your fee values, 0 0.65, 0 0.75. Those are fairly low fee values, aren't they? I mean, what was our fee value most of the time for beams? 0.9? Why was that? Because we had steel that helped contribute to the section's ductility, right? Here we're talking about concrete purely in compression. When concrete in compression fails, it goes and it goes quick. Okay? Now I'm going to go back, you know, way back you know, a few slides to show you something. Uh, uh, oh, didn't mean to do that. Give me a moment. We're talking about columns, so there's no pun there. You remember this? Remember this, this ACI strength reduction factor, the fee value? And remember I said it was a function of the strain in the steel. And with enough tensile strain, we were able to achieve a fee value of 0.9. Y'all remember that? Well, how much tensile strain is there in a column in, that, that's under pure compression? None, right? Not a thing. So if there isn't any tensile strain, what are we dealing with? 0.65, right? It all sort of comes around full circle. Uh, where was that? Oh, yeah. All right. Sound good? Okay, so a couple things to... Um, uh, a couple things to... to uh, go through in terms of detailing. So let's talk about some of the steel. So and, and also just some of the, uh, the the different dimensional requirements that are associated with columns. So number one, let's talk about the reinforcement ratio. Remember that reinforcement ratio? It's the area of steel divided by the effective area of concrete. Y'all remember that? Basically one of the things that AI or ACI dictates is they say we don't care what's going on. You have to have some amount of steel in there, but not too much. And basically they dictate that the amount of steel that goes into that section must be somewhere between 1% and 8%. So your reinforcement ratio is somewhere between 0.001 and 0.008. And we'll see that reflected in some design aids later on. <coughs> if you're dealing with a rectangular section, you have to use at least four bars. If you're dealing with a spiral section, uh, you must use at least six bars. Okay? And this is just for safety requirements and ensuring that your column behaves according to what the spec dictates. Okay? Now, this last one is not 
technically in the spec, but it's a good practical dimension. A good practical minimum dimension for a column is somewhere between 8 and 10 inches. Like a very common minimum size that you'll see is probably like a 12 by 12. It's probably pretty common um, for, for your minimums. I mean. Okay, so here's a couple requirements, and this is, I know it's kind of nitpicky, but it, structural engineering can be nitpicky at times. Here's some requirements for tied columns, mostly for your rectangular or your square columns. Okay. Your minimum tie size, you know, you've got these bars that are resisting the load, but you've got to tie that up accordingly. If you're dealing with bars that are number 10s and smaller, you've got to use an, at least a number 3 to tie them together. If you're dealing with bars larger than a number 10, you've got to use a number 4 to tie those together. All right? Now, your tie spacing, uh, the minimum tie spacing, is either an inch or the longitudinal bar diameter. The maximum, however, is 48 uh, diameters or 48 tie bar diameter, 16 longitudinal, or the least lateral column dimension. Um, we'll go through those calculations and sort of uh, define it out. A really common one you'll see is something like a foot, like every foot have a tie or something like that. Just depends on the dimensions and, and what's going on with your column. Um, additional, some some additional requirements. <coughs> All right, so. If you have a column that looks like this, the maximum spacing from one bar to another clear spacing uh, can't be bigger than six inches. Um, let's see. Uh, for some spiral columns, spirals have to be number three bars or larger, which is a little bit of a silly spec in my opinion because that's about the, most, the smallest commonly available spiral bar anyways. Um, Clear spacing between spirals though has to be between one and three inches. If you're going to use a spirally reinforced column, you have to provide sufficient reinforcement. So there's something to that. A very common one, two inches. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? I know it's a lot of like nitpicky dimensions and details, but it kind of is what it is. Anybody have any questions? Well, it, the, the problem is how do, you, how do you bend it and detail it accordingly? It'd be just kind of tough to do. Um, my first sort of an, uh, initial smart aleck answer was that the column would explode. No, it, it would just be hard to con, you know, get your spirals point. And it, w it wouldn't fit the behavior of what we're going to check later. Like, we're going to check uh, the required amount of spiral reinforcement based on a thin walled pressure vessel. And when we do that check, we assume that that thin walled pressure vessel is circular. So it'd be a different check. So you'll see that here in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, which is why which is why a very common one's two inches. You're right. Um, keep in mind, a you are talking about number three, and I'm trying to come up with this in a way that or answer this in a way that makes sense. Between the spiral reinforcement and the longitudinal reinforcement just being there under that compressive load, they themselves provide a fair amount of confinement. I'm trying to answer this. The cover that you're talking about, you know, the, the penetration that you're talking about, under failure modes is not as big a deal be, because, let me skip ahead a little bit, we're talking about situations kind of like this, where the concrete outside has spalled off. We're accounting on the strength inside that, that spiral dimension. Does that make sense? The, the, the locking of those two, you know, inside the spiral and outside the spiral, it's not that big a deal. All right, does that make sense? Any questions? All right, I think I'm going to be nice to you all today and end class a little early. Um, next time, however, we are going to get into, you know, columns pretty heavily. We're going to do some uh, analysis 
and uh, we're going to do some analysis and design of centrally loaded columns, and then we're going to look at interaction between load and bending, and then guess what? We're done with reinforced concrete design. That's we only have two more weeks. That's that's it. So. All right, we'll see you.